Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We appreciate you helping to make the world a healthier place. We're going to start today with what may be a surprising headline. Eating meat will help you live longer. Yeah, let me say that one again. Eating meat will help you live longer. Indeed, on this very plant-based podcast, I am telling you that there is research out there that shows if you eat chicken or steak or pork, you are more likely to live longer than those of us who keep it plant-based. But could there be a little flaw in that research? That's what we're going to find out today with Dr. Matthew Nagra. He is here on the podcast, and we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So if there is something that you would like to ask Dr. Nagra, cholesterol, meat, otherwise, go ahead and post that in the comments or in the chat, and we will get to as many of those as we possibly can today. You can also send them to me on Twitter or Instagram. I am at Chuck Carroll, WLC. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Nagra to the exam room live. My friend, good to see you again. Good to see you too. Okay, so here we go. We got a question from a viewer who said, look, I fell for Dr. Nagra's <laughs> April Fool's joke on Instagram, which, by the way, at dr.matthewnagra on Instagram. Phenomenal follow. Uh, but this this particular viewer said, look, you know, he was talking about studies that showed that meat, if you eat meat, you are likely to live longer than others, which I thought, well, that's an interesting question to pose. And how could they come to this result if you have the World Health Organization saying, well, red meat and processed meat, they're known to cause cancer. So let's talk about this research up front. I will ask you specifically Tina's question. Can eating meat add years to your life? <laughs> oh, it's funny that that was actually a question that was thrown in. Um, so I, what really got me with these headlines that went around and with the people promoting it was the individuals who are promoting this message based on a recent study, which I'll get into the specifics uh, in a bit here. They're the same people that always suggest that nutritional epidemiology is garbage research. We can't trust nutritional epi um, because, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation and, and all those you know common terms that get thrown around. So those same people who question what I would consider really good nutritional epidemiology are throwing out what I would call really bad nutritional epidemiology. And so the reason that this was um, poorly conducted epi is because it's what we call an ecological study. That means they're just essentially looking at correlations across populations um, between a given exposure, in this case, meat intake and uh, an outcome, in, in this case, lifespan. And so what they found is that countries where they consume more meat or actually not technically where they consume more meat, where there is greater meat in the, or greater amounts of meat in the food supply, they have higher or um, longer life expectancy. Of course, there are a lot of confounders there. Countries where more meat is uh, purchased or available um, also tend to have higher uh, socioeconomic status on average. Uh, they tend to be the, the um, you know, countries with just uh, more resources, more healthcare or better healthcare. And so this is really just looking at a correlation between um, the meat that is available, not even necessarily the meat that's consumed because they didn't consider food waste. They didn't consider um, uh, uh, food loss in, you know, not even, not even off our plates, but in say grocery stores and that um, it was just the amount that was available. And by their own standards, their own results, I mean, obesity was slightly protective against child mortality. You don't see people running with that headline either. Um, it's just really, really weak science. Um, what we need to do in order to determine if, say, meat consumption increases or decreases lifespan is we need to look at similar populations while adjusting for, uh, with varying levels of meat intake, while adjusting for things like socioeconomic status, um, the rest of their diet quality, uh, whether they exercise or not, whether they smoke or not, uh, and see that if you compare populations with similar uh, characteristics in those other um, realms I just mentioned, and meat intake is still associated with higher risk, then we can be more confident that meat um, is increasing risk or decreasing risk of disease. And funny enough, we actually have a similar analysis uh, that we could do with smoking. So if you look at cigarette consumption across populations, countries with greater cigarette consumption also have higher life expectancy. So would these people who are running with the headlines that, oh, meat extends lifespan, would they also consider 
cigarettes to ex extend lifespan? Probably not. I would hope not. <laughs> anyway, because we have really good, solid, again, epidemiology showing that there's a consistent association between smoking and risk of X, Y, and Z disease, <laughs> a lot of them out there, um, when controlling for all of those other factors that weren't considered in this meat um, meat study that came out. So it was just a really bizarre paper. And that's that's really just scratching the surface. There are a whole bunch of other issues with it. Um, there are concerns around the journal it was published in um, being what's considered a, a predatory journal, meaning that they essentially just publish whatever if you pay them. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, with, with weak, weak review uh, or a weak um, kind of peer review process. Uh, there's just a lot of issues there. So th that would be the kind of short explanation. Um, and, and I'm sure we could get into a lot more detail if we wanted to as well. That was short, man. That was a, that was a good three yeah. minute answer there, man. That, that was, that was, that's good. And, uh, the childhood obesity and cigarette, uh, parallels that you are able to draw there, I think really speak volumes for, uh, you know, the, the quality of that research and the data that came out. So, uh, appreciate you answering that one. You talked about, you know, all these different countries, let's go ahead and do a roll call right now. People checking in from literally all over the world today. We have Joanna in Lebanon, Alma in Sweden. We have have Monica from Colombia, who's there. Dana's checking us out in St. John's, Florida. And then we've got uh, Heidi, who's able to join us for the first time live. She's in Greeley, Colorado. We've got Pete down in Colombia as well. So lots and lots and lots. Oh, and Miss Amy is up in Canada. So uh, your home country, my man. So uh, people all over the world tuning in wanted to get the answer for that question, man. That's that's really cool. Um, Question from Sam, though. Let's take our next question. So we talked about red meat, processed meat, known carcinogens. Sam is wondering whether chicken is as unhealthy as they are. So the research on white meat in general is pretty weak, uh, or it's it's not usually able to tell us a lot about the association between those foods and risk because what we call the contrast exposure the the comparison between say low levels of intake and high levels of intake is typically really small uh, people aren't eating as much of these um uh within a, a given population so um as it stands right now we don't have really solid evidence i would suggest that white meat is healthier than red meat and the reason that I would suggest that is because we have what are called substitution analyses, where you look at what happens to disease risk if you keep everything else similar, but you substitute out white meat for um, red meat, or sorry, you substitute out red meat for white meat, and you can reduce your risk of, of certain diseases. But you can also see similar by replacing white meat in some cases, in some studies with plant protein sources. Um, so it's really a spectrum. There is no, uh, we, we can't just throw everything into this box of bad and everything else into this box that's good. Um, there can be, you know, processed meat and then unprocessed red meat and then white meat. And then we got, you know, plant foods, fish, all, 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 like it, it works along this spectrum. Uh, we can't really just say healthy or unhealthy. That being said, we do have one really interesting trial um, that looked at red meat, white meat, and plant-based protein. Um, and this one found that even if you keep fiber intake the same, you keep saturated fat intake the same or, or very similar, um, white meat and red meat both raise our LDL cholesterol, um, which is a cardiovascular risk factor, to a similar degree, whereas, or compared to uh, plant protein, which um, can lower it. So um, it still suggests that, yeah, there is some risk there with white meat. It's not, uh, it's not going to be as healthy as the uh, plant-based protein sources. So um, again, just adding more to that whole spectrum idea I just mentioned. Oh, we're going to talk about the other white meat here in just a second. But first, a couple of uh, successes to pass along. Pastor Anthony Nix watching on YouTube today says he just started eating a plant-based diet and has lost 10 pounds and seen his blood pressure come down. So congratulations, Pastor Anthony and Sally Palmer. How about this one, Dr. Nagar? Sally Palmer, my doctors all credit my vegan diet to my long survival with no additional problems after five bypasses in 1998. Wow. How about that? That's crazy. Yeah, that's very impressive. I know. Congratulations, Sally. That is fantastic. All right, let's take a question from Tot. That's a fun name. Uh, so we just talked about chicken. Now the other white meat that we were teasing. How unhealthy is pork? Tot is a fan of bacon and pork chops, but wants to go plant based. Well, pork's actually red meat. Um, so it would fall under the, the category of red meat with things like beef. And 
that is very, very consistently associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, certain types of cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, potentially pancreatic or prostate cancer as well. So um, I would I would say that it's on the the far end of that spectrum, maybe before, uh, of course, the process meets and that, but um, certainly on on what I would consider the wrong side. Uh, wasn't there an advertising campaign back in the day? Pork. They called it the other white meat. Like that's that's why I was oh, really? rolling with that one. Yeah, I'm. I, I mean, I, I could I'm be not crazy. A- I'm not aware of that, but pork is, is considered a, a red meat as far as like the scientific literature goes, for sure. Uh, for sure. It's usually uh, uh, combined into that category. I, I mean, if if I'm wrong, exam roomies, please let me know in the chat. Uh, Syed checking in today from Bangladesh. I think that that's a new country to check off. That's pretty cool. Uh, question from Anya right now. Uh, my family has type 2 diabetes, and they're asking me as I transition to a plant-based diet, why not just eat lean meat? or fat-free or low-fat dairy, wouldn't that be just as healthy? So um, it depends. Th- those are all different things. So let's start with the lean meat for a, for a second. Um, there's this idea out there that lean meat um, doesn't come with its uh, risks or the risks of red meat. And I would say it's less risky, sure, because you have less of the saturated fat, which can contribute to disease risk, uh, whether that be diabetes or whether that be uh, cardiovascular disease. But we actually have research that controls for saturated fat intake. So what I mean by that is we have research looking at red meat intake, but equating the amount of saturated fat between the different sort of diets that that you'd be comparing. And we still see that there's typically a risk with things like cardiovascular disease. We see that heme iron intake, uh, which is the one of the types of iron that we're going to get in red meat, is associated with um, type 2 diabetes as well. So I suspect that while it's probably better than than the fattier cuts of meat, uh, it still has some risk there for uh, things like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, um, amongst other outcomes. As far as fat-free or low-fat dairy, um, for, for type 2 diabetes risk, I'm actually not too sure about uh, the associations there, um, or which, which way the, the risk might go, uh, if at all. Um, but for cardiovascular outcomes uh, is certainly a better option than full-fat dairy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, But we have a little bit of research comparing even low-fat dairy to, um, say, soy milk. And for cardiovascular risk factors, we still see a little bit of a benefit with the soy milk. So with nutrition, we're always considering compared to what, right? Um, Compared to a lot of things, sure, low-fat dairy is a better option compared to other things, uh, maybe not so much. So um, it just depends, again, where on that spectrum you want to sit and and, uh, shifting more towards um, options like soy milk could be even further beneficial, um, at least for certain outcomes. With, with diabetes, I'm, I'm not 100% clear on that, although we do have some research on soy consumption reducing risk. All right. Uh, so we've talked a, a lot about meat. By the way, uh, pork, the other white meat, 100% confirmed by the exam roomies. That is a real thing. Matter of fact, Stephen Turner, I had forgotten about this. Uh, Stephen uh, says that there was even a NASCAR race that was called Pork, the Other White Meat 400. So, I mean, if that wow. doesn't say it all, I mean, there it is right there, man. That is your, wow. your advertising dollars hard at work. Uh, Jennifer is wondering if you could talk a little bit about the unhealthiness of seafood since we've been talking a lot about meat. So what are the dangers there? So um, with seafood, uh, actually, for the most part, seafood is typically associated with good health outcomes. Where we see um, where we see potential risk is when you're having a lot of fried seafood in particular. So if we look at American populations, um, in particular, there's actually one substitution analysis I can recall. I, I think it was American population. Uh, where substituting out fish for plant-based proteins was actually uh, beneficial, that, that shift towards the plants. Um, but that was likely being consumed in the form of a lot of fried seafood. So when it comes to seafood versus um, plant foods, I think it really comes more down to the environmental impacts and the ethical aspect. Um, Like I personally would choose not to eat seafood because I don't think we should have to kill trillions of of sea creatures per year for for, uh, my taste buds or or for nutrition. And um, I think there's a lot of damage being done to our oceans as well. Um, so I think that is the reason to shift more away from seafoods, whereas uh, I'm not super convinced of a lot of inherent harm. But then you look at like fish farming. I mean, you're talking about yeah. ethical reasons there. You see these documentaries yeah, exactly. and just kind of the atrocities of the health of the fish. And then, you know, I'm... I, 
I, I because I just it's not on my radar because I don't eat it on a daily basis. I don't eat it at all, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's just it's hard for me to fathom eating something that looks so diseased and and thinking that that's healthy. Like to me, that just doesn't equate. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get what you're saying, and and I think there is that kind of mental emotional kind of aspect to it. Like you're eating something that that was robbed of its life for you to enjoy for what 15 minutes. It's just, it, to me, that is the reason not to. Uh, JD is wondering about mercury in seafood. How big of a concern is that? Yeah, so this this is actually a good point, I think, to raise a few issues that come up uh, when it comes to nutrition science or actually a, a whole bunch of other um, health-related topics too. We have to look at health outcomes. So there are going to be components in various foods, including in plant foods. Plant foods are not free of contaminants. Um, no food really is that could in isolation in a certain concentration be detrimental. What we have to look at is what happens when you eat that food. And when we look at research on whether it be seafood consumption or you know, soy consumption or, um, or other legumes, nuts, vegetables, whatever you want to look at, we see that they're associated with good health outcomes. We even have, again, substitution analyses, aside from the potential issue of, of you know, fried seafood in, in one or two um, uh, uh, substitution analyses, we see that substituting fish or, or seafood for um, plant foods is a relatively neutral shift, maybe slightly beneficial on the uh, plant side. Um, so again, I, I don't think that it's a really strong argument to make. And I think there are much, much stronger arguments to make for that shift towards a plant-based or vegan diet as, as of course, uh, you and I uh, consume. Let's uh, shift over and talk a little bit about cholesterol really quickly. Malik, wondering whether a low-fat plant-based diet or exercise is better for lowering cholesterol. Oh, diet, hands down. Um, exercise, weight loss, they can have an impact. It's actually, oh, for, this is for trig triglycerides in the question though. I'll talk about, um, cholesterol first. Um, so for cholesterol, weight loss, exercise, all good things. They, they contribute, um, to a degree, uh, to cholesterol lowering, but you can make a much larger impact with diet, uh, particularly reducing saturated fat intake, uh, a little bit of an effect with reducing cholesterol intake, which usually comes by switching to a plant-based diet anyway. Um, and increasing fiber intake, increasing polyunsaturated fats, so um, you know nuts, seeds, uh, and uh, their oils. I actually think that it is conceivable that a higher fat plant-based diet, specifically getting a lot of those fats from nut and seed sources, would be even better for lowering cholesterol than a low-fat plant-based diet. Um, and that's because the best um, macronutrient for lowering uh, LDL cholesterol levels is actually polyunsaturated fat. It's better than carbohydrates. Uh, it's better than monounsaturated fats. So um, that would be my position there. As for triglycerides, um, I mean, technically a low-fat plant-based diet could actually raise triglycerides if it's really high in refined carbohydrates, but I know that's not what we're talking about. If you're eating a lot of fiber-rich plant foods, um, I'm actually not sure how that would compare to exercise. I'd have to look a little bit more at the exercise research on triglycerides specifically, uh, but definitely a fiber-rich plant-based diet can be really good for, for lowering triglycerides as well. I think that when it comes to comparing diet and exercise and the effectiveness or this of that, I don't think that there has been a single expert who has come on this show and said that exercise is going to trump what you eat. You know, um, I remember specifically talking to Dr. Kim Williams about this recently and asking him that very same question that uh, an exam room he had sent in uh, when it came to cardiovascular health. And he, he said 90% of it is diet at least. And I think that that's so surprising to so many people because when they look at improving our health, a lot of times, what we do, what I used to do very often when I was still overweight was prioritize exercise over diet. And that's just such backwards. Is that something that you have to work with your patients on? Um, well, see, I don't think we need to focus on either or. I like to focus on both. Um, the thing is, I think there is a subset of, of especially the like online nutrition or, or health community that really hones in on exercise being everything and, and uh, calories being everything, which are important. Of course, I don't want to discount that, but I think we lose sight of the impact of diet quality and whether it be for, again, cholesterol levels or blood pressure, diet quality is king. And usually with better diet quality comes 
um, better calorie balance and, and all of these other uh, benefits down the road anyway. So um, I, I do see that more online than I do with my patients because because with my patients, I want to work on both. I, I want to see how we can incorporate regular activity, whether that's going for a daily walk or if someone has other goals, you know, you know, running, weightlifting and so on, um, as well as uh, cleaning up the diet. Stick with the cholesterol here. Take a question from Amy. Wants to know if cholesterol is hereditary, can it still be lowered naturally? Uh, so um, you're probably talking about familial hypercholesterolemia here, which is where you can have a really high um, LDL cholesterol, so-called bad cholesterol, um, is the, the one that's uh, more likely to, to cause the disease um, or the one that makes up the majority of the lipoproteins that cause uh, atherosclerosis um, or heart disease. Um, so if you have familial hypercholesterolemia and it is sometimes you'll get, you know, five, six, seven millimoles per liter, even higher, which in milligrams per deciliter, which is, I know what you use in the States. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that conversion works, but um, I'd have to calculate it, but it's really high <laughs> just to, to make it clear. It's super high. Um, we, we see that you can have an impact with diet, but it's usually not going to be enough. Usually in those cases, medication is necessary and a, a really good thing to consider because we see individuals with um, with LDLs that high have heart attacks in their 20s or 30s. And it's just so sad because there's there's a really, really good, safe um, uh, uh, intervention that we can do to lower it and, and help extend their lifespan. Um, and there is just a lot of concern around medications like statins online, uh, largely due to misinformation um, that really pushes people away from them. So a lot of what I do in my practice, too, is actually educate patients on like, look, this is the reality of, of the situation. This is what your risk looks like. And this is how medication can help in addition to a healthy diet. It's not again, it's not either or both can be helpful here. Um, and you can't really achieve. Uh, the types of LDL cholesterol we'd like to see with just diet alone in a lot of those cases. And, and for those who don't have the genetic component there, mm -hmm. is if they come in and their cholesterol is sky high, is the typical approach then to per prescribe statins in the short term and then uh, have them modify the diet to bring it down naturally the rest of the way? Or do you just go all in with the diet and avoid the statin up front? It depends how high we're talking. If it is sky high, I would doubt that it's just diet alone anyway. Um, if if they've never had a cardiac event before and they they really, like some patients will come in to be really adamant they don't want to try a statin. And um, after I've informed them and they still decide to go that route, we'll see what we can do with diet. Absolutely. And then we'll figure out, do we need to add medication on top of that or not? But for a lot of cases where... Um, you know, patients might be high normal, just above the normal range or the, the what's considered the healthy range, which I actually think is too high anyway. Um, we can try to, to work with just diet first. Um, I have no issue with that. I always want to inform my patients of all of these options and see what they want to do. Um, but uh, but I, so I don't push necessarily one approach or the other. I, I like to say, look, these are our options. This is probably the most effective route, but um, what do you want to do? And then we go from there. You said something interesting there that cholesterol in the normal range you still consider to be too high. Why Why do you say that? Yeah, so as we increase um, our LDL cholesterol from the bottom of the normal range or even below the normal uh, range up until the, the top of the normal range, we see that uh, rates of atherosclerosis actually increase even in um, populations where they don't have other risk factors. So you, you kind of see this risk just go like this from within the normal range. And a lot of heart attacks actually happen in the normal range. I, I think it's about a third, but I, I don't want anyone to quote me directly on that because I might be slightly off. But uh, um, so the ideal range is actually right at the bottom of the normal range or even below uh, the normal range. But the issue is that most people won't get that low. Um, a lot of people, just their genetic baseline will be a little bit higher. And then for even more people, given um, how we live, uh, their their diets and other lifestyle factors are bumping it up as well. Uh, let's talk about uh, cholesterol and heart attacks. Apparently, there's some confusion there. A question from Laurie wants to know, are there any large-scale double-blind studies that prove cholesterol causes heart attacks? She says that she, her understanding is that half of the people who have had a heart attack actually have normal cholesterol. So can you help clear up some of that confusion? 
Yeah, so that's kind of what I just pointed to as far as normal cholesterol, um, the normal range might still be too high. Uh, we see that atherosclerosis or the plaque buildup in the arteries uh, doesn't really develop if you get the, your LDL cholesterol low enough. Um, now, as far as large scale double blind studies, we have a gazillion of them, the scientific term right there. Um, we have tons of cholesterol lowering studies, whether that be through diet or through statin medication or other types of medications. There are, are multiple different types showing consistently that if you reduce your LDL cholesterol by X amount, we get a, a certain uh, um, degree of, of uh, lower risk. Um, we also have what are called Mendelian randomization studies. So this is looking at genetically predicted LDL cholesterol levels. So those with genetically throughout their entire life, higher LDL cholesterol levels, um, they have higher risk. Those with genetically lower levels have lower risk. And it's dramatic, the, the difference in risk we can see there. Um, even if it's not a huge reduction or a huge increase um, over the course of your life, heart disease or coronary heart disease is about lifelong exposure to a given LDL cholesterol level. So what I mean by that is it's, it's based on the amount of LDL that you're exposed to today and tomorrow and the day after and the day after for your entire life, it adds up. So um, if you have throughout your entire life, genetically somewhat lower LDL cholesterol, you're going to be protected by a large degree throughout your life versus someone who's just genetically has a higher baseline for their entire life too. Um, so yeah, we have, we have enough research to say that not, not specifically um, the cholesterol itself, the LDL particle, um, which is what uh, interacts with the artery wall and, and gets uh, pulled into that space and the cholesterol gets oxidized and there's this whole mechanism that occurs there. Uh, but it, it is what carries the cholesterol that, um, that ends up causing the issue. Uh, I think that the next natural question is a good one from Martina at 1226. Martina is wondering, well, then what foods help to lower cholesterol? What would you recommend? Great question. Um, so there's actually, I'm going to shout out a Canadian researcher here, David Jenkins, um, in Ontario, I believe. He, um, he designed what we call the portfolio diet. So this is essentially a list of foods or, or types of foods or, or certain types of nutrients that are known to lower cholesterol. And what you want to do first is you want to get rid of the, the foods that or lower the, the amount of foods that raise your cholesterol and then or LDL cholesterol, and then you want to add in the foods that lower it. So as far as the foods that raise LDL cholesterol, we're looking at saturated fat rich foods. These are full fat dairy, meat, um, coconut oil or palm oil, if, if we're looking at plant sources. Um, and then we also want to consider potentially dietary cholesterol, which would be in, again, the animal foods, including eggs being a, a, a rich source. And then we want to add in these portfolio foods. So what are they? Soluble fiber rich foods. Um, these are things like oats, okra, eggplant, um, fruits, uh, just generally a uh, psyllium husk uh, can be one more of a kind of supplemental approach. Um, so we want to include those foods. We also want nuts and particularly almonds seem to be the best for this. Uh, but in general, nuts as a whole, pretty good idea. Uh, we also want to focus on plant protein sources and especially soy. Soy seems to have uh, some unique cholesterol lowering abilities beyond what we see with other types of legumes as well. So um, just, yeah, eat your legumes, eat your beans, lentils, lentil pasta, which I love. And, uh, and of course, uh, soy based foods like tofu, soy milk, and so on. And then there's another um, part of that that is um, usually more of a, a supplement. Um, and that is plant sterols. So plants contain these sort of cholesterol-like compounds, we'll say, uh, and they can impact um, our cholesterol levels, lower them as well. And you can get them in supplement form or even fortified in certain types of uh, foods. But obviously, that's that's something just to speak with uh, your doctor about to figure out, you know, what the, the right approach is. All right, let's talk about nuts here for a second. This is something that a lot of people struggle with, right? So we talk about just having a little bit of nuts, like maybe a palm full a day because they are rather high in fat, right? But that's such a hard thing for so many of us to do. So as a doctor, what is your recommendation for making sure that we don't go nuts with nuts? <laughs> so um, with nuts, actually, we have um, multiple meta-analyses now showing that nut consumption actually doesn't seem to cause weight gain. Uh, it seems to be pretty neutral. It also doesn't contribute to weight loss, um, but doesn't seem to contribute to weight gain. And while it is rich in calories, it also seems to be quite filling. And that might be why. 
Now, if you're like salting and roasting the nuts, it might make them more palatable, you more prone to overeating on them. So definitely something to consider. But unless a specific part of our goal is weight loss, I usually wouldn't restrict them because as far as health outcomes go, things like uh, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, um, all cause mortality, uh, we see some of the biggest reductions in risk with nut consumption compared to any other food group. Very interesting. All right. So you, you made a, a key point there though, right? So try to find the nuts that aren't uh, roasted. I assume you mean roasted with oil and salted, right? But yeah, dry yeah, roasting is good to go? Yeah. I, I think it's it's more of the yeah, roasted with the oils and salts and everything that can make them just more palatable and, and more prone to being overeaten. Again, that will be an individual thing. Some people will be fine you know, limiting their, their intake in, in some way, and, and others might uh, be more prone to overeating, but it, it totally depends on the individual's goals, right? So um, I, I don't want to you know, blanket prescribe for everybody because everybody's going to be a little bit different in that sense. Oh, bro, sign me up for the overeating crowd with those. I mean, that's one that I know that I, you know, if I'm not really careful, I will, I will plow through a jar of peanuts, um, go real heavy with the peanut butter um, on the toast in the morning, whatever the case may be, man, uh, just nuts. They're just so good. Uh, okay. A uh, question from Lucille. This is a, a good one. So maybe if you could answer this one simplistically from a, a natural standpoint, how do you unclog your arteries? Wow. Um, so it depends what you mean. Um, so if you're talking about, if you're talking about plaque regression, which would mean like you have plaque buildup in the arteries, uh, contributing to, to, um, coronary heart disease and you want to reduce that. Well, right now, the only consistent method shown to, to really do that is really intensive medical therapy. Um, like intensive statins and other uh, medications as well. Uh, and the degree to which that is the case is, is variable. But I don't think that should be the goal. The goal is we want to reduce risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. The What happens or the degree of blockage in the artery doesn't necessarily need to be the main goal um, if we can reduce your risk of having an event, right? That, that's, I think, what we ultimately matter or what we ultimately care about. So we have a lot of interventions that do that, whether that be dietary, whether that be medical. Um, so I, I like I'm not entirely clear if that's specifically what's being asked here, um, but I don't know that we have a, a good amount of data suggesting that you know anything other than really intensive uh, medical therapy can really even make a dent in that uh, sense. All right, we have time for a few more questions here, so keep on posting them in the comments or on the chat. And you can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chuck Carroll WLC. Find me there. Send me your questions. Uh, there's a lot of chatter right now in the chat, as a matter of fact. Uh, people wondering about spinach and how much is too much. Uh, they're worried about maybe overdoing it with, I think, the oxalates and kidney stones and things of that nature. So when it comes to spinach, what's the limit, my man? So um, I think there might be some people that are more sensitive than others uh, to oxalates as well. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Um, but it seems that based on uh, data from, I believe it was the nurse's health study, that oxalates are most problematic in people who have low calcium intakes. So if you're having a lot of calcium from, say, a fortified plant milk, and you're doing that in a smoothie with spinach or something, it, it's probably not a big deal um, as far as the data I've seen, because the calcium binds up the oxalates. Uh, now, if you're smashing like five, six, seven cups of spinach blended with like water or something or, or doing like pure beet juice by the gallon, um, yeah, that might be a problem. I'm not going to rule that out by any means. Um, but overall, it seems that it's not that big of a deal for people who are uh, consuming um, a decent amount of calcium. And of course, we have to look at, again, what's the risk of kidney disease? We see that vegetable consumption is, if anything, associated with a lower risk. So um, that is ultimately what matters, not the mechanism at play. Uh, we have somebody, Crystal, right now, 1235, wondering about the effects of caffeine, whether they're positive, whether they're negative. Where do you fall with those? I would say as far as beverages go, coffee and tea are incredibly healthy. Uh, and it's it's very consistent. Uh, we have multiple umbrella reviews, which are essentially where they compile all the meta analyses on the topic. So it's, it's a really huge data set, and they consistently show you know positive after positive, except for the cases of things like coffee during pregnancy potentially, and and uh, you know certain certain special cases like that. But otherwise, unless caffeine 
um, bother someone in a way that it does make them say jittery or uh, anxious and that were, um, of course, on an individual basis, something you should probably limit or especially before bedtime or, or in the evening. Um, it seems that, that they are totally fine and, and healthy things to, to consume. All right. Uh, let's take a question here from Andrea. This one, uh, this is actually a holdover from our last cholesterol show. And I can't believe that I haven't brought this one up yet. This is a good one. And, and I hope for chocolate lovers, it's not going to be a heartbreaker. Uh, Andrea's question, can vegan dark chocolate cause high cholesterol? She does also note that she does have that genetic predisposition to high cholesterol. Okay. So that's a great question. So chocolate has a fair amount of saturated fat but it's a specific type of saturated fat, uh, largely called stearic acid. It is one of the types of saturated fat that doesn't seem to impact um, uh, cholesterol levels. And as a further benefit, chocolate consumption seems to be associated with a lower risk of heart disease or heart attack. So um, if anything, it seems to be a, a good idea uh, for, for most people, and it doesn't seem to negatively impact uh, cholesterol levels. Uh, so maybe that's a, a win for people uh, listening. I, I certainly like to have a little hot chocolate here and there too. Uh, yeah, but then the follow-up for Maximus, does sugar increase cholesterol in vegans and I guess everybody else? So um, pure like refined sugar um, seems to be able to raise not necessarily LDL cholesterol, but VLDL cholesterol. It, it, it functions in a similar way. So uh, by to make it really simple, I would say, um, yes, it seems to have an impact, a relatively small impact, uh, but there does seem to be one there. Mommy vegan nummy right now. So, well, that reminds me, I have dark chocolate in the fridge. Be right back. I'm going to get it. Uh, awesome. <laughs> uh, next to last question comes to us from Connie at 1237. Uh, we talked about foods that lower cholesterol earlier. Now let's talk about foods that can lower blood pressure. Connie is wondering, what are they? Um, well, for starters, let's, let's talk about foods that raise um, blood pressure, sodium. So if someone does have high uh, blood pressure, we want to lower sodium. Uh, consumption, so salt uh, primarily. Um, now, what can lower um, blood pressure? Uh, as a nutrient, potassium seems to be really good. So potassium-rich foods, obviously the one that, that a lot of people uh, know are bananas, but there's things like dates and that as well, um, uh, as well as legumes. But uh, nuts appear to be really good for blood pressure as well. So nuts all around seem to be great, right? So we got the blood pressure lowering properties, we got the cholesterol lowering properties. Um, uh, so I would say if I had to really hone in on one, I'd, I'd say the nuts, um, and actually flax seeds, flax seeds seem to be really good, um, as well. All right. Final question comes to us from Wilma at 1237. Wilma is wondering about legumes, wants to know whether or not they can cause arthritis. Cause arthritis uh, is not something I've ever heard. Um, I know as far as, uh, inflammation, if anything, they would, uh, help reduce that, uh, which can contribute, I guess, to, to joint pain potentially, but that's, that's very speculative. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even put too much stock in that, but legumes are super healthy by other means. I have never heard of a connection between legumes and arthritis uh, in particular. So can't really, I guess, comment too, too uh, deep on that one. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one. I hadn't heard yeah. that one yet either. We've been doing the show for what five <laughs> years almost. And that, that was the first time that question has ever come up. I was like, okay, I'm definitely going to get this one on. Um, so that's a good one. So we're going to go ahead and close up the doctor's mailbag for today. Um, and I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to add one more for myself. Okay. How's your dad doing? When, when I was up in <laughs> Vancouver, uh, you and I had a chance to, to chat last fall and your dad is such a character. And he said that he wanted to challenge you to a race. Now your dad has what, like 30 some odd years on you, but says he could smoke you. So where do things stand with this race right now? And can we live stream it when it happens? Oh, you can definitely live stream it. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, every time, every time he's brought up the idea of this race, he, he came watch my soccer game. He's telling all my teammates that he can beat me in a race. Um, look, let's go. I just played a full game, but let's go anyway. And uh, he won't, uh, he won't do it. The one time actually he was willing to race me was when I had an injury. I had an injury. I was like, I'm hurt. I can't run right now. Um, so uh, yeah, he's going to watch this. He's going to be so mad, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so like, um, no surprise that he's saying that to your teammates because we were in this big convention hall. I mean, we're talking like thousands of people are, are running around the Planet Expo there. And literally he is telling this to anybody who would listen. Like it was fantastic. I thought that the man was building up a pay-per-view or something like that. Like it was, it was just incredible and he would not let it go. He absolutely no. would not let it go. So I want to put 
some pressure on him. I want to turn the screws on Daddy Nagra there to see if this race can happen uh, when both of you are healthy. I think he was saying that he had a nagging injury at the time. Otherwise, he would have raced you right then and there in the convention center. So anyway, uh, Dr. Matthew Nagra, you are fantastic. Thank you so much for being here today uh, on Instagram at dr.matthewnagra. Uh, give him a follow. Just such great information there. And what is your website? Good, sir. That's just drmatthewnagra.com. Simple. There it is right there. We will have you back again soon. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks for having me. All right. And if you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a point or two, go ahead and like this video, subscribe to the channel and uh, do us a solid there. And that will help to continue to raise not just your health IQ, but literally the health IQ of other people around the world. So on behalf of everybody here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. Until next time, keep it plant-based.